The introduction to the documentary is a tribute to Marlon Santana. This documentary will give you an insight to life in Bedford Iverson, then and now. Whatever crime you accuse me of, we can solve it. Check it out. Bedford Stuyvesant, Bedford Stuyvesant, heard, heard, heard only when black skins fight against other black skins. Heard only in the newspaper, Coney Island can be Bedford Stuyvesant if a black man did something wrong. Bedford Stuyvesant, Anywhere could be you, wherever black people are, wherever black people are, 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 are standing, wherever black people are, are, are standing, are, are standing, understanding, understanding, Bedford Stuyvesant, my home. Bedford Stuyvesant is one of Brooklyn's oldest neighborhoods. It originally was made of two distinctive neighborhoods, Bedford and Stuyvesant. Bedford was named after a Dutch noble, Lord Bedford. Stuyvesant was named after Peter Stuyvesant, also a Dutch noble. The influx to Bed-Stuy happened, say, pre-World War II. Uh, we had a, a number of black people, probably maybe right after the Depression, moved in and um, a lot of the whites were moving out of the brownstones. Um, you had white people who actually were head of the railroad, um, uh, lived on Hancock, and uh, you know, 
these, these were mansions, these brownstones. Um, and they were actually gated areas. Even when I was a little boy, there were still gated areas where they had, you had a gate to get into those streets. So, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it was a community in transition. I mean, Reed Avenue, I don't even know who that was named after, but I know who Malcolm X was. Do you understand? I know who Stuyvesant was. That's why it was called Stuyvesant Avenue. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant. <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, having, you know, a street named Malcolm X, a street named Marcus Garvey, you know, my grandfather and them, they were involved in the, uh, it was, uh, uh, what was called the Paragon uh, Progressive Association, which was a, a credit union, which was part of the whole Garvey movement. You know, and back then, a number of indigenous blacks from Bed-Stuy, they were involved in that stuff. Um, the Brathwaite's, they had the Scottsboro boys uh, stay in their house, you know, when they were in that whole infamous struggle you know, and people were trying to find them to, to lynch them, you know, uh, they were here, you know, in Bed-Stuy, on Hancock Street, you know. So I'm just saying that there's a lot of, there's a, so much, uh, and I don't know if I've given you enough to really get, get, get a feel of it. Growing up in Bedford-Stuy, it was great. Um, I went to school not far from here, Holy Rosary School, on Bainbridge Street, between Malcolm X and Stuyvesant. It used to be called Reed Avenue. My fondest memories would be not be analysts, and that was clearly not. But I remember that the discipline of, of living in Brooklyn and, and living in a, in, a, in a block with brownstone homes. It was a great, it was a great uh, growing up. Uh, in fact, we were in the middle of the place where I spent a lot of my youth. I went to PS 35. I went to um, PS 83. East New York Vocation High School. It was great living in Bedford Stuyvesant. Still great. I was born in Bedford Stuyvesant area. In fact, I was born in Weeksville and have lived in Bedford Stuyvesant since 1941 or 1939. Well, growing up in Bedford Stuyvesant, it was a little rough because you know people would try you when we was poor, you know, so we didn't have much food and much clothes to wear. But my mother always taught us to do the right thing, you know, don't do crime, don't do drugs, get education. Uh, my family was born in Brooklyn also, my dad, and my grandfather was born in Brooklyn. My mom was born in Baltimore, Maryland. My family was here since 1910. Fulton Street Park, we played everything on the grass here, football, you name it. Uh, Fulton Street was full of uh, stores that were owned by black people. I can see the stores now where Boys and Girls High School is, uh, Lefty Sushan Parlor, the Butler Florist. The Berry Brothers were right over, over the subway, tip top at the other corner. It was a it was a beautiful community to grow up in because of the the closeness of the people. It was like an extended family. And I first became involved with Assemblyman Van when he was a teacher in the Ocean Hill Brownsville district, and he had an association called the African American Teachers Association. I was a senior at Boys High at the time, and I had uh, we had an association called the African American Students Association. They became our mentor. Uh, that is uh, Al Van and G2 Wausi, Les Campbell. And from them, uh, the institution, the East, grew. And so the first Afrocentric uh, cultural institutions in the late 60s, early 70s had their roots here in, in Brooklyn, in Bedford Stuyvesant. I, I tell children, I tell people today that they don't know the real Bed Stuy. This used to be. A jumping capital, I would call it. I mean, you could go out any time of day and night, go anywhere in bed -Stuy. If we did something wrong, one of the neighbors would come down and correct us, and if necessary, whack us, right? With a belt or with a hand or something, and then go back and sit in the window. And you'd say to yourself, I hope that Mrs. Williams, I remember Mrs. Williams was famous for it, is not going to tell my father when he comes home in the hill. And now I look up the street and here would come my father walking down the street six foot two, 230 pounds, and Mrs. Williams would call out and say, I had to correct the boy today. And he would stop and listen to her because she was looking up because she was in the third floor when they owned the whole house, the whole family. And, uh, and he, she would tell him whatever the offense was, which to me was not a big deal. And he would say, fine. And by that time, my friends were already making the sign of the cross and clowning around because they knew I was going to get it. 
So my father would say, come with me, and I'd walk back down. We, the Williams family was 366, we leave 376, we're talking five houses. We'd walk down to the house. I'd go in, and my father said, now tell me what happened. And no matter what I told him, I was going to be in trouble, but I knew. I'd say, well, she was confused. Well, that was the wrong thing to say, because how can an adult be confused and you know, a youngster? Um, and I would try to plead my case as best. And he said, and he used to say, okay, go outside and play. When you come in, you're going to get a beating. Well, that was like, what would you like for your last meal kind of thing. And then you'd step outside, and there would be all my friends, maybe a half a dozen of them, saying, oh, Grace is going to get a beating. Well, a beating back in those days, I say a beating, you'd get whipped at a belt or something, or a hand or something. But the point is, is that it was, it was almost like entertainment. Because, you know, first of all, I don't, we didn't have televisions at the time. We were still getting spankings. And uh, so all the guys would go get a soda or something, or a or, or candy bar, and sit on the stoop and discuss how this execution was going to happen. Was he going to get a belt, a beating with a belt? Was his father going to hit him? How many times is he going to hit him? And, and, and we're all standing around, and I'm sitting there, you know, my shoulders are sagging, uh, thinking that, you know, and they're all discussing it. Because and the, the, th the interesting thing was, is the next night, I'm laughing as I think about this, but the next evening it could be one of those guys. I say, so you need to understand that, and there was no air conditioning in those days. We had screens in the windows. So they knew that also they could hear the whack. I mean, if they listened, I mean, they would almost be, you know, they would sit there and say, what do you think you'll hit them with? I don't know. How many times do you think? I mean, that was that kind of conversation. And they're, and they're sitting there kind of in sympathy, but just discussing this thing like they're discussing world problems. And what they're discussing is me getting a good A weapon uh, when my father uh, decided to call me in. With the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge and the elevated railroad in the late 1800s, Bedford and Stuyvesant were more accessible to Manhattan, and factories began to develop, drawing more residents. Bedford-Stuyvesant meant so much or played so much in my life. Uh, I came from uh, Georgia. My uh, home is Harlem, Georgia. But then I had spent a uh, considerable length of time, four years in the Army, World War II. And then I came to New York in September of 1946. And from that point, uh, the persons that I met in Bedford-Stuyvesant made so much to my life. I've been living in bed for the last 30 years. I love it. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Everybody is, you know, everybody from every country you see in bed -Stuy. And the happiness of the place, you have all kinds of food from all over the world you can get in bed -Stuy, Caribbean, you know, East Indian, all the dishes. And, you know, you have all the good music from all the different in Africa. You got everything here. So it's a melting pot. And everybody now is moving back in bed -Stuy. I was born in 1950. I was born right here at uh, St. John's Hospital, which is now Interfaith Hospital. And the first place I lived was on St. Mark's Avenue, but I don't remember that. I was only two years old when I moved to Van Buren Street between Lewis and Sumner, which is now Marcus Garvey. And I've been living there, well, my family's been living there ever since. I've been through so many changes because I've been living, but where I'm living now, I've been living there for over 50 years. I mean, I've seen it go down and I've seen it get rebuilt. And every, when everyone moved out to the island, we stayed, and now everybody's coming back. Because <laughs> even the priest, like St. Peter Claver, he, he was so shocked to find out that the Chandlers are still there. I said, yes, where are we going to go? <laughs> I mean, I feel very comfortable here in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, all my relatives, a lot of them, they move all over Brooklyn. They moved down to Florida, they're down in Philadelphia. Most, some of them, well, some are still here in Brooklyn, but at least I'm here so they could come back. When they want to come back, you know, to visit, I'm here. <laughs> My name is Monroe Shannon, I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I've uh, lived in Bedford Stuyvesant for about two and a half years. I moved here from Los Angeles. And originally when I moved uh, to Bedford Stuyvesant, I was looking for a place to stay. And I ended up finding a place to live. I found a place that has uh, become my home. Um, what initially drew me to this community was the fact that it did feel like home. It felt like a place that was very grounded, very spiritual, and a very warm place. I've been in the community 10 years, mm -hmm. and I recall that when I came, I saw a lot of potential here, mm -hmm. 
um, but I did see some hopelessness as well. Mm -hmm. And what I see now is a lot of goodwill and a lot of optimism. I think that people are starting to recognize that we're walking around on diamonds and pearls. Mm -hmm. And when you know that, then you don't throw down trash and dog do. Mm -hmm. um, you really care about your community. And so it's changed a lot. We have a lot of young people who are coming in and buying the brownstones and renovating them. And the, the, the energy between those young people and our elders who have lived here and who have so much wisdom to impart, mm -hmm. it's an incredible combination. I actually just moved here about almost a year ago. Um, I used to live in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill area, and um, I used to live in an apartment building, so now we bought a house over here, and it changes really nice, and now I like living in a brownstone. Um, I like the area so far. Like, I wasn't too crazy if I moved to Red Sky, but now that I'm actually here, you know, I'm, it's not like what people used to be saying, like, oh, you know, Red Sky is, eh, you know, it's just loud, and but it's not, I haven't seen any of that so far. St. Philip's Church was founded in 1899 in the Weeksville community, which, as you know, is the first community in which black people lived in Brooklyn. As the neighborhood of Bedford-Stuyvesant changed in the 1940s, St. Philip's Church moved here to our present location in 1944, and we've been here since then. Well, actually, Good Shepherd Episcopal Church was here from 1926 until they sold the church to our spiritual ancestors. So it was, it's been an Episcopal church since its inception. But as the neighborhood changed from white to black, the people who were a part of Good Shepherd Church began to move away. And that's how we happened to take occupancy of the building and to purchase its, the, the realities it contained. Bud Baker, in my estimation, was truly the type of person that was necessary at the time to open the door. Bud Baker would deal with the things which were important for the people without making a noise about it. He would deal with the person who held the key. And obviously it was the uh, power structure of Brooklyn. I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the Presidency of the United States of America. I am not the candidate of Black America, although I am Black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman, and I'm equally proud of that. I am not the candidate of any political bosses or fat cats or special interests. I stand here now without endorsement from many big name politicians or celebrities or any other kind of prop. I do not intend to offer to you the tired and glib cliches which for too long have been accepted part of our political life. I am the candidate of the people of America. I recall um, Dr. King coming here to Brooklyn, you know, uh, in the 60s, having the opportunity to see him. As an expression of deep sorrow at the death of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and to allow employees to show their respect to this great American by attending memorial services, the mayor has directed agency heads to excuse on Tuesday, April 9, all employees of the city. Being around Dr. Ray, um, by my father being very close to him, um, he, he came here from um, Ohio at the time to Cornerstone when he took over Cornerstone. He was from Texas, really, from Dallas, Texas, and he was in the uh, 
I'm not mistaken, in the Congress, U.S. Congress in um, Washington. He was a congressman before he came to Cornerstone. He was in the government. And uh, he came to Cornerstone, took Cornerstone over and led Cornerstone from Irving Place in Gates Avenue to where it's at now at uh, Lewis and Madison. And like I said, uh, he was one of my, uh, what you say, mentors coming up. Uh, I wanted to be like, I didn't necessarily want to be a preacher, but I wanted to be, you know, following some of the things that he had done, his civil rights activities, uh, his fight. Uh, he was, to me at that time, the uh, somewhat Al Sharpton of the day, only on a uh, not so much of a limelight uh, Al Sharpton. He was a little more low profile, a little more conservative, but he did get the message out. I mean, I saw Concord burning when I was a little boy. You know, the fire was such an attraction. It was the biggest fire, and it's probably the biggest fire I ever saw in my life. You know, to just run, and we had to stand back like three blocks you know, just to see that. Um, and then just the amazing ministry that Dr. Gardner Taylor has garnished out of that, the rooms of that, you know. Um, so, you know, to start brand new, you know, uh, I mean, he became, you know, he was then, became like the preacher of preachers, you know. Uh, he was a great teacher and leader for our community. My most profound memory in Bedford-Stuyvesant would have to be going to the school PS35. At that time, we uh, again were in the minority, uh, but it was a very interesting time. I felt the teachers in the school were definitely trying to make the transition in the different races at that time, because that, I'm talking now about the early 30s. Um, I went to school in Bedford-Stuyvesant even when I did not live in Bedford-Stuyvesant so that primarily my education was in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area. I then attended girls high school which also is in this area and um, that was at one time one of the most well-known schools. If I could say one thing positive about Bedford-Stuyvesant, it is Boys and Girls High School and Frank Mickens and the fact that He's preparing people to be leaders in that school. You know, like one of my first experiences wearing a necktie was in Boys and Girls High School. And it was given to me by Mr. Mickens. And that's the passion that he, he creates. A lot of stuff that he, that he used back then to motivate us and stuff that I use in business now. Like his, his theme song for the school was Ain't No Stopping Us Now. And I use that theme song with my staff now. So. That's one of the good things about Star is Boys and Girls High School. It's a gem. It's like it's a, a hidden treasure, really. Brooklyn Tech gets all the attention, but, but Boys and Girls is like the undercover gem. Do or die in Boys High. Well, I love Boys High. Um, people always had a, a, an opinion of an all-boys school, but hey, we had guys like uh, Tommy Davis, Connie Hawkins, uh, Lenny Wilkins. I mean, we had some great guys come out of Boys High. And, uh, hey, I enjoyed every day of it. The teachers like uh, guys who know Boys High will know Miss Belvedere and, and uh, Dean Mabel and, and uh, <laughs> Mr. Oliner. These are all teachers that we all had. And uh, I always remember there was a church right across the street, which is, uh, was Gardner C. Taylor's church. And there was a little store on the corner. And when you had lunch, some guy, one guy would be elected each day to go out and get the sodas at the store. And the one day that I had a chance to go out and get the sodas, who catches me but Gardner C. Taylor? Boy, why aren't you in school? And all I could do was turn around and go back into school, and I didn't have sodas for, at that time it was Von Hopper. I don't know if you've heard of Von Hopper, and I didn't bring Von his soda. So. But uh, we had really good times. You know, it wasn't all about violence. It was about learning and becoming something. And uh, the competition was, was great because we had competition with basketball, baseball, softball, and also studying you know, who could get an A.
the 1930s, the term Bedford-Stuyvesant was permanently designated. The detailed story of Bedford-Stuyvesant's history can be found in the book A Ghetto Grows in Brooklyn by Harold X. Connolly. Oh, Mr. Skeen, the finest gentleman that ever lived. I don't think no one have had a husband like his. The only thing is Gilbert didn't like to go to church. Because when he was a little boy in Barbados, he had to go to church every morning, and that was around 7 o'clock in the morning there, those 7 o'clock services early. And then when he came here, he just didn't feel that he should be running to church all the time. But he was very religious. He never drank, but he smoked himself to death. The most important aspect is that she always insisted that I could go up the ladder. She, when I was uh, in Brooklyn, she passed out literature. She became a member of the uh, uh, of the club, the political club, and uh, she always worked with me. And uh, that's why I think it's so important. And October the seventh of. 2001 was our anniversary. 57 years we had been together and she was then in the hospital and she passed January the 30th of 2000. I know nothing of my life that would have been as is and I have been the hotel, the f ownership of that, the friends, all the way to the White House. But all of that was with Mama, and that's why we call her Mama. I, I met my wife on a blind date. Um, at the time, I was already a lieutenant in the Army. Um, I was stationed at Fort Dix as a training officer, so I had a new company about every 16 weeks of young people that we were putting through basic training. And, um, and I, was, I had gone to Ranger School and I had gone to Airborne School and I was a young lieutenant and you could not tell, and I had shiny boots and I wore the paratroopers orphans up and out of airplanes, so you could not tell me I was not the sharpest thing. Making $240 a month that you the guy that ever put down on earth, right? And then it, it was nobody looking like me walking around Bedford Stuyvesant very often. So I mean, I, and I would, and at the time, on Sunday morning, uh, and I picked some of this up from being in the army down in Georgia, but the place to meet women was to go to the church. I mean, I was not meeting anybody. I was in Columbus, Georgia. And uh, my friend said, my, a sergeant said to me, Lieutenant, you gotta go to church. I said, I'm looking for women. He said, Graves. That's what I'm telling you, you got to go to church. Well, bless him. My mother was a strict disciplinarian. She believed in always do the right thing. Sit up, shut up, speak when spoken to, uh, respect your elders, believe in God. And uh, I couldn't be in any gangs, I can tell you that now. And she said, education, son, is, is you have to be educated. She says, I don't want you to go through life like some of the other people in our families. You gotta have an education if you wanna get somewhere in life. You gotta know what they know. And of course, you have to know more than they know because they're gonna put you to the test. And my kindergarten teacher, I always relate this story. When we moved from Bedford Stuyvesant into Park Slope, you were sitting alphabetical order and my last name was Bolt and I was like third. And the teacher asked, the classroom to get up and introduce yourself and tell the people what you want to be. 
So I got up and said, my name is Wayne Bolt, and I'm going to be the president of the United States. And the whole class, including the teacher, laughed. And for some reason, that bothered me. And when I went home and told my mother, the very next day, my mother escorted me to school and introduced herself to the teacher and told the teacher that if my son wants to be the president of the United States, it's your job as a teacher to make sure he gets there. And uh, whew, from that day forward, my whole family, myself, my brothers, my sisters, who went to PS9, we had to do good. We only lived three doors away from the school, so. My mother's, my mother's name was Augusta Aku. That was her maiden name. And she married someone, uh, my father's name was David Turner Duckett. Uh, my mother was uh, from a family that was northern born, northern raised, and uh, remained living in the northern part of the country. My father, on the other hand, was born in South Carolina and uh, worked on the Pennsylvania Railroad as a cook and married my mother. Uh, my mother married my father against the wishes of her father. Having attained this outstanding academic record at Girls High School, I guess my grandfather, whom I really didn't know, he died before I was born, but I've heard would not have thought anybody was good enough to marry his daughter. But he certainly objected to her marrying someone from the South and someone who did not have the same academic education that she had. My mother walked for four years from their home on Adams Street to Girls High School in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section on Halsey and Nostrand Avenue. And that's probably somewhere between two and three miles. And this was four years, every day, uh, all seasons, because the family had no car fare to give her. And uh, I believe that the record shows that she was always on time and had a fairly good record in terms of attendance. I'm from the old school. If you do something wrong, a good swift kick in the butt will straighten you out. And a lot of kids would rather be kicked in the butt than arrested. And a lot of them were just mischievous and not bad, but peer pressure and, and you got to be bad to live in Bed-Stuy. A lot of them uh, today appreciate the fact that I just gave them a little swift kick in the butt rather than to lock them up because they don't have records. And I always remember from sitting in the court, in Judge Murray's court, that if the judge hollered and screamed at you and made you look stupid, it was for a reason. He'd rather do that than to give you a record. And people would get all uptight. Well, what is he hollering at me for? But in turn, they would walk out that door and not be arrested and not have a record. And they wouldn't understand that. They thought he was being above the law. And, and I always, we knew, because we knew the judge when you sit in his court, we knew if he hollered at you, you, you were almost guaranteed not to go to jail. But if he sat there very quiet and reading the things, you're going to jail. My father started this business with my brother in 1989. And uh, by chance, I was brought in the business due to the fact that my brother left him as a partner. And uh, I filled it in his shoe. And that's how I got involved. Make it known that uh, a black man could make pizza and, if, and possibly do anything he could do, want to do if he put his mind to it. But it's so unique that a black man do pizza that they aren't aware that I'm here doing pizza. I think that uh, folks have to do what my mother did. My mother was head of the PTA, she was a high school graduate, never saw a college, and she, but she knew what had to be done. This is what we're gonna do as far as education because you have from some very strong block associations still here in Bedford Stuyvesant. The tough thing you have is, is that you have these avenues that, that uh, border the cross streets that run through Bedford Stuyvesant and those need an economic uplift and what they need to have are uh, uh, small business loans which we've, we've, the, the government has tried to do before but either state or city government 
that allows people to set up businesses and, and those people who are going to have those businesses have to know how to run them. This is no longer a thing of, you know, I want to have a laundromat and, you know, you just come to work every day and, you, and you're not going to run it in terms of uh, the courtesies extended to people, um, the amenities that you're going to provide in your store, keeping the place clean and how you're going to run it. If we don't have the underpinnings of a community in terms of the quality of what's there, quality of the stores, fresh food, and if I have a grocery store, the hours you're going to open so you know that if it's 10 o'clock and the store is supposed to open at 10, you can walk down there and find that place open. Um, the, the opportunities of offering other people in the community jobs so you're hiring residents in the community. We were here during the riots in the late, uh, for early 60s, and uh, we had many businesses that were broken into uh, at that time. And as you look around now, you don't see, you know, the, the businessmen in the area as they were before. I felt that we have to have more people in business if we're to survive as a black community. So, which, uh, and this, everything is up in question because I don't have too many people in the community right now that's, I would say, I'm friendly with that we can become business partners in a sense of helping beds die. We, we don't have the cohesiveness that's needed to run a community that I see because we don't make, like I say, we don't pull any strings here. We have to take whatever is offered to us and what we get. I don't know of any groups that sit down and say we're going to plan business strategies for beds die. However, other people are making decisions for bed style, not us. I opened Brownstone Books in June of 2000, so we've been here a little bit more than three years. Um, my husband and I are originally from the neighborhood. I was born here and came back here to live as an adult in uh, 1995, so we've been here in the neighborhood continually since then. And we just decided that, you know, we knew bed is a wonderful place to live. We know that our neighbors are fantastic and that it's a strong community, but what was really missing was a place where we could go to just sort of be together and enjoy each other's, other's presence. And also, the shopping has been a continual issue in the neighborhood, so we wanted to do something commercial that gave people the opportunity to talk, share ideas, um, grow some ideas that had already been existing, and then also to bring some commerce to the area. And we felt like the bookstore, Brownstone Books, and the antique store, the parlor floor that we opened, really do serve as venues where people can come to express themselves, certainly through literature or the spoken word, reading clubs um, for adults and young people, but to also bring up the neighborhood in terms of the uh, retail potential of the area. The Weeksville Society is an organization that is roughly 32 years old. It was formed in the late 60s uh, by a small group of people who discovered four houses that were built in the mid to late 19th century. These houses were the last remaining residential homes of uh, a community called Weeksville. And Weeksville was a community of free African Americans um, who had a thriving society. They had um, their own school, their own newspaper, their own home for the age, um, and orphan's home, churches. It was a multi-class, I guess you could say, um, society, a community of people who had freed, had been freed, who were either free here or came from the South to be free. The museum that I founded three years ago is also in Bedford-Stuyvesant on Stuyvesant Avenue between Jefferson and Hancock. So there's definitely a community feel in the neighborhood in terms of knowing your neighbors. Um, my family's had a long-standing history in Bedford-Stuyvesant where um, upon coming from the South, this was primarily where most of, well, all of my family um, began their roots, which were in Bedford-Stuyvesant. So we own businesses such as a cleaners, a luncheonette, candy store, and different businesses in the neighborhood. So. My family's background is very strong here in Bedford-Stuyvesant. My name is MZ Moyo. Uh, I am a resident of Bedford-Stuyvesant. I've been a resident for about 40 years later. We're the uh, 
premier cultural presentation on the eastern seaboard. But one of the main features of the festival is that it's uh, in the home of Bedford Stuyvesant. And we're right here in, in the Heights. It's called Stuyvesant Heights. And the community and the festival, we, we work very close together. Uh, the festival attracts members of our community from all over the planet. Uh, we have members that come from Africa, Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria. We have members that come from the Caribbean, Guyana, uh, Trinidad. We have a new contingent this year that's coming from the UK. The um, African Street Festival is a very great idea. It's nice to see all the black people together without the violence and negativity. And I can't wait till next year. I love Brooklyn, it's my favorite place, and God bless America. About 26 years ago, a group of individuals living in Bed-Stuy, uh, myself, Brenda Frierson, George Glee, Bernard McDonald, Ruth Mitchell, and a bunch of others, uh, decided to form an organization to change the public image of Bedford Stuyvesant. We were, try we were tired of seeing newspaper accounts, news accounts of crime happening in Bedford Stuyvesant, identified as Bedford Stuyvesant. When we look at the real demographics, it was outside of our neighborhood. Uh, we started an organization to uh, sort of foster pride of living in Bedstuy. We developed a slogan called, come on home, come on home with the bed sty. Uh, I want to show you a neighborhood where people live here uh, by choice, uh, not crime ridden. We uh, are raising good families here. We have our kids going to schools here. We want to show the positive image of Bedford Stuyvesant to try to like um, combat the negativism of what's been happening in the news media. You know, I really love the brownstones because I, I grew up in a brownstone, a couple of brownstones in bed -Stuy, and then I moved like to East New York. It didn't have the same feel. And when I finally was at my mother's house, I came back because I just wanted to be, this is a different feel about Bed-Stuy. So I just loved like the brownstones and the architecture. My friend and I are on the brownstone tour today in Bedford-Stuyvesant. And um, you know, we're, we're both neighbors in Fort Greene and I've been in, you know, from Brooklyn my whole life. And you know, we're just looking into the houses, to just the, the love and the, re, you know, the restorations that people are putting into them. It's, you know, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful to see the history and the neighborhood. I've lived here for four years and I live on Jefferson and that block has totally changed. Um, there's been seven new families to move in and they are white. Um, and the way I feel truthfully, if you want my truthful, I, I love everybody. Um, I'm not a racist person, but I do know from experience that once white people start moving into an area, the rents go up and the people that live here are unable to afford it anymore. And I'm getting a little emotional because I'm one of those people. You know, they've sold my building to um, some people and I have a very good, beautiful one bedroom, um, $700, but now they're gonna redo the building and they're gonna start charging 15, 1700. And I'm asking, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? And it's been said that they don't care. And it, it, it makes me sad. And I don't understand. I, I don't understand why that is. And these houses are just beautiful and it's a great community. It really feels like a real neighborhood, just like Fort Greene does. You know, it's the reason why I live there now is that it's a real creative community and you just feel very open to be, you know, free right there, in that neighborhood right there. And I feel the same energy here. So I could, yeah, my friend and I have been walking around going, ooh, maybe, ooh. If someone would just give us $100,000, you know, we'll buy a house tomorrow. <laughs> I am a resident of Bedford Stuyvesant and Stuyvesant Heights here on Lewis Avenue, as a matter of fact. Um, love this community. It's a warm, loving community. Lots of wonderful people with good places, a lot of great homes. Um, I moved here. I was coming here from D.C. on a visit to New York, staying at the Aquaba Mansion, and just fell in love with this community and got to know people. And um, here I am, and uh, this is where I wanted to be, and I'm here, and I'm loving being here. And, you know, I'm here to actually add and do what I can in the community. We still have a lot more, there's a lot more to do, but I see opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities here uh, for entrepreneurs and, and many other people. And it's just a good environment and a lot of love around here. There's no doubt about it. There's lots of love here. 
and that's what that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So you know, you got something to offer? You you know, you're fabulous or whatever. Come to Bed for Stuyvesant because Bed Stuy really is a wonderful community. It really, really is. Well, Love and Donovan, my fourth novel, actually takes place here in Bed-Stuy. And the main character, Campbell, she lives on Bainbridge Street. And I chose that street because they have such beautiful brownstones. And Campbell's parents move from Canarsie, and they move into Bed-Stuy, and they buy this very old, very beautiful, uh, very elaborate brownstone. And uh, I thought that because I did the same thing, the, the book was solely written in bed -Stuy. So Campbell's life, in a way, follows my own life. And it's something that her parents always wanted. And that's kind of an extension of myself. Um, so Love and Donovan, it drops in January 2003. And it is definitely a, a non-traditional love story. My funny valentine. Sweet comic valentine, you make me smile with my heart. Mm -hmm. Your looks are laughable. Oh, Photographable, yet you're my favorite work of art. <laughs> the first uh, time I saw uh, Miles Davis was at the Coronet on Fulton Street. First time I saw him, uh, Max Roach, who grew up in the community. Uh, a lot of jazz musicians were from, from the hood. So you got a chance to see them, you knew them personally. And there was always, any night you could find a jam session of jazz somewhere in Bed-Stuy. Somebody was jamming somewhere. Uh, Moulin Rouge on um, Putnam and um, Marcus Garvey. Just had a bunch of places that you could go at any given night, any type of music you want to hit. You know, hearing the stories uh, from my uncle Bubba and his friend Pickles and my dad and they, the things that they used to do back then, they would have um, basketball games and play music at St. Peter Claver's and uh, 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 AME Zion Church on Tompkins and McDonough and they would play these basketball games and in between or after they would have dances. And some of the people that were involved in that actually became famous musicians and artists. So that was pretty, you know, striking to me as well as the basketball players. So you had people like um, Mr. Clement, who was one of my mentors, who actually was a mentor for um, Lenny Wilkins, who's the coach presently of uh, the Raptors. Um, he was also the coach and meant for a, a lot of NBA players, uh, ABA players. But his coach, uh, Jimmy Gittins, you know, who taught Mr. Clement at Boys Welcome Hall here in Bed-Stuy, which is on Chauncey Street and um, Malcolm X Boulevard, which is Reed Avenue back then. You know, they had a basketball. He was, he was also a basketball player, but Jimmy Gittins was also a sculptor. So I would hear stories from Jimmy when I was young about um, things that they would do. Uh, for instance, they would have a, uh, a show where Jimmy would, would um, have his, exhibit his artwork. Um, Langston Hughes would read poetry and um, Randy Weston would play music or Max Roach or Lester Young or many of the other artists. It's, it's our destiny. You know, this is our, like I, I, I do not want anybody else to tell the history 
for us, but us. Nobody can tell it better enough than us. Ed Stuy is probably a good place to do business. There's a lot of nice people here, a lot of friendly people here. I mean, it's it's a great neighborhood, and I'd like to see it survive. I just want people to not take Bedford Stuyvesant for, for granted because this is a rich and wonderful community. And as long as we as people respect Bedford Stuyvesant because other people betray Bethel Stuyvesant as a, as a place that they don't want to be at, want to live at, and they make it seem like it's a crime, crime area. But I tell them, I'm here, I've been here, and you know, hopefully blessing with the most high is I will stay here. We can make a difference. We can make a difference. We've got to vote with our dollars. We have to vote with our ballots. We can make a difference. We have to save our money, and we have to look to the future for our young people. Well, it's been a good experience. At first, like, when I would try to go to sleep, I would hear people using profanity and stuff and sit it down. So I couldn't go to sleep to go to school the next day. But, like, when I first, like, came here, I met friends of everything, and we all used to have, you know, fun outside. We would play, run around, and we talk to each other. And, like, now everything, like, basically changed, and I mean, like some most of them left and I feel kind of sad but I think like some of it changed for the better. My advice to the youth of bed -Stuy is to stay true to yourself and do whatever is going to make you happy in life um, in the long run. Um, never go out after anything that's just about money because you know 20, 30 years down the line it's not going to be fulfilling. So follow your dreams. We are part of America, and we can produce. Anyone who lives in bed -Stuy, don't let people dog you, don't let people tell you you can't be anything because you're from Bedford-Stuyvesant. There's too many of us from Bedford-Stuyvesant who have made it. And no matter where you're from, be it Bedford-Stuyvesant, be it Park Slope, be it Crown Heights, whoever you are, whatever you are, reach for the sky, and it's there for you to get and don't let anyone tell you that you can't make it. And if history will tell you, we have millions of people who were from Bed-Stuy who are famous people now. There are some that may not even be famous, but they're making it. And uh, that's, what's, that's what it's all about. That's what life's all about. Reach for that stars, don't let anyone, I don't care who they are, I don't care what color they are, tell you you personally can't do it, because you can. Work hard, study hard, and that was the same for my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Ruth Scott. Work hard, study hard, and you become anything you want to be. Check it out. Martin Luther King's dream was for all of us. Beauty. That man had a dream. The 
that, brother. Do that. Intelligence. The future. Walk along to the best I be. Ride strong to the best I be. Move on up to a front row seat. To the best I be. Best I be. Walk along to the best I be. Side of the picture, the camera's the pixel light.